Hey everybody, welcome back to HPC Tech Shorts, the engineering water cooler here in AWS. Uh, this week we want to talk about storage because uh, just recently when we did the um, HPC Speeds and Feeds event, uh, we had Jordan Dolman from the FSX team talking to us about FSX for Lustre. It generated an awful lot of questions. Uh, it was a really good discussion. And so we decided we wanted to come back and drill down on that. Uh, and so today, Jordan is here with us uh, from Boston. Hey, Jordan. Hey, thanks for having me, Booth. Uh, you know, when I... When I built my first Lustre file system, uh, and I'm not going to put a date on it because it, I'm just starting to feel old when I talk about this, uh, but when I first did it, I remember it took us, you know, it took us weeks to stand the hardware up. Um, uh, it took a long time to get the software installed, like days and days to get the software installed and get the file systems actually laid out. Um, uh, and so we're already months into a multi-month long project for deploying a supercomputer at this point. Um, and then it took us weeks to get the system stabilized. And then we had this horrible incident where the power flapped inside the data center. And uh, uh, we had some battery back write caches on some, on some uh, uh, RAID controller cards where the battery just wasn't apparently so good. It wasn't backing the right cache. <laughs> <laughs> and so we lost the whole file system. Like it just, that was it. All of the data just went. We had to rebuild the whole thing again. It took us weeks again to get it back to where we were. That that was Luster. And even though Luster's got more friendly and we've kind of all defanged it a fair bit over the last few years, Luster's still a beast to manage. Yeah. And, and these big file systems are like, they're, they're not a button that you press in a console. They're projects. Right, right. But you people have turned it into a button in a console. Yeah, you know, when we uh, when we were first building out the FSX offering, uh, you know, we, we saw this need to deliver very high level performance for HPC workloads. It was kind of like a, a gap in the portfolio on AWS. Yeah. And, and Lustre seemed like the obvious choice because it was battle tested in industry and it, you know, it, it delivers the performance. Um, but as you said, it's it's not quite easy to, to get it set up. Uh, and, and there's a lot of thought that has to go into, you know, how do you tune it? How do you how do you pick the right, not just the, the hardware components, but how do you actually pick the right sizing of, of every server disk uh, to, to create something that, that really works well for uh, either one particular workload or a range of workloads? And these, are, and these are decisions you typically have to make, like, you know, in a physical world, these are decisions you make one day in January <laughs> that are going to impact you for the next five years because because that's what people do. Yeah. They build a luster and they hold on to the damn thing for five years and more. It becomes a thing that has to maintain a life over the course of potentially decades. It's a it's it's a big it's a it's a lot of decisions and they're and they're very heavy decisions. Um, you know, was was interesting is when we went out to to take advantage to harness all the capabilities of Luster, we, we also made the conscious decision uh, to kind of abstract away a lot of that complexity uh, wow. on an ongoing basis, you know, there's there's the day to day challenges of I'm running out of space on my file system, and so we said, all right, well, we know Luster allows you to you know kind of reconfigure, add new servers. Let's add that into our API so that you can scale a Luster file system once again with an API call. Um, I want I'm going to get you to show us how that works because. Because obviously you're extending out the cluster by adding more OSTs or mm -hmm. more OSS nodes with OSTs on them and, and making the cluster bigger. Do you then also re-level where all of the files are? Is that is that a process that happens? Yeah. So, you know, uh, it's one thing to add to add more storage and give customers, uh, you know, more capacity. Um, but the power of Luster really relies on all the, the data being laid out evenly uh, and distributed. And so our our scaling workflows that we run on the back end um, will also rebalance data. Um, and so we do all of that kind of behind the scenes. And that's that's to the point, the magic of, you know, how do you make Lustre user-friendly? You make it so people don't have to think about those things, yeah. right? I can yeah. jump into to my console here. Yeah. Uh, and you can see this is this is what the console looks like. You know, we can we can name our file system HPC1. We have a, a range of different 
persistent. So those are kind of replicated uh, file system options uh, on, on SSDs and HDD based storage. And when you say replicated, you mean fault tolerant, anything goes wrong, you've got a fully, fully symmetric replication of the data on two different LUNs on two different servers. Yeah, we've got we've got mirrored disks. So there's multiple copies of all of all of the the data. If a server goes down, uh, we can automatically kind of recover from it, move to a healthy server um, without kind of interrupting operations, uh, you know, and kind of like losing data as an example. Um, so everything is is kind of highly available and, and highly durable. Yeah. Okay, that makes sense. And then yeah. and so SSD and, and HD is kind of self-explanatory. Scratch. Mm -hmm. This is just give me fast. I want it cheap. <laughs> yeah, this is this is our unreplicated offering. Uh, you know, we have uh, what's really interesting with FSX for Luster is because you can create and destroy file systems with an API call. Um, customers, about, about half my customers, don't necessarily keep their file systems up and running on an ongoing basis. They spin up and down oh, yeah. files throughout the day, and so they create a Luster file system for a few hours. Uh, you know, sometimes thirty minutes. Uh, and they run a workload, and then they and then they tear it down, and that that speaks to one of the the biggest uh, reasons why we built FSX for Luster in the first place is that uh, customers were coming to AWS saying, "I want this could these ephemeral, like high scale clusters of compute," and so you know yeah. you can see here we've got a range of of throughput levels. So for every terabyte of storage, you could have you know 250, 500, or even a gigabyte per second. Of uh, of throughput, um, so you know a twelve terabyte you know file system in this case would give you you know twelve gigabytes per second of throughput. Uh, we have all these different options, and you can you can kind of pick and choose what you what you want to build. So if you were to dial in, say for example, you know two hundred terabytes. So this is this is telling me the increments we can build on. To your point on the. Uh, no, right. The specific OSTs and oh, I see. Right, OSTs, okay. It doesn't right? it doesn't want to round down for us? It's or round That's up. Right. It's telling us where to go. Okay. Yeah. So so close enough. Mm -hmm. All yeah. while the shouting, two hundred terabyte storage. I've got a what a two hundred gigabyte per second sectional bandwidth. Yeah. Yeah. Fast system, and I can. That's that's really neat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you know, and we have, and you can see here, you know, if you if you click, you know, if you don't need that much throughput at that amount of capacity, because you know all of this scales together. So customers yeah. sometimes who have more storage will choose a lower throughput level because you know maybe twenty five gigabytes per second is sufficient here, right? Um, yeah. And so you know, a few a few clicks, and then you know, if you want, you can just say I'm I'm done. Um, you know, click next here. You, know, you, you can see it's now in the creating process and typically it's it's eight to ten minutes um and then you've got your your file system up and running uh just as a sidebar everybody should notice in that left hand column there in the, the side menu you'll see open zfs and you'll see snapshots there yet another there's another bit of voodoo getting done with the file system yeah um, and that's one of everybody's favorites too just the ability to have a cheap and cheerful open ZFS file system as an NFS server for a cluster is, is highly popular thing to do. That's right. And, and once again, just a, a few clicks and then you've got your file system. You can keep it up and running long term or you can tear it down if you only need it for a you know short period of time. Um, and then, you know, for for all the file systems, we offer uh, point in time backups as well uh, and automatically replicated across availability zones so that you know, if, if you want to spin up that file system somewhere else in a disaster recovery situation, like, oh, you yeah, can do that. once again, five or 10 minutes, you can be back up and running. So minutes. what if we wanted to attach one of these things to a to an S3 bucket? Because that was the that was the, you know, that's, again, that's more of the voodoo magic that's going on here, you can actually attach the file system to an S3 bucket, which could yeah. be a petabyte of data in there. Yeah. And, and you're essentially making it a hot tier on top of that S3. Yeah, so we, we have a lot of capabilities that, you know, you can you can kind of uh, update a file system after it's been created. So, you know, you can see here, you can change the storage capacity, you can add more servers, you can turn on data compression to get uh, better better uh, performance or uh, or also obviously better uh, data utilization. Yeah. And then we have these this data repository tab where you can create these associations. Uh, this one here, is is associated with with an S3 bucket, so we could actually add more buckets here if we wanted to. Um, 
yeah, here you say where on the file system uh, we, we should put this path. You can think of FSx for Luster's integrations as uh, as uh, uh, different kind of namespaces. Uh, so, so basically, you, every S3 bucket would have a different path on the file system where it would get um, uh, linked to. And then you set all these kind of import and export policies. What do you want to see happen on the file system? Do you want all the, the data to be kind of always synchronized from S3 on the import side? Do you want all the data from the on the file system to be pushed back to S3, kind of exported as well? And so that's what we've done on, on this particular file system is, is we have this this link you can see here where uh, this demo bucket of mine mm -hmm. uh, is set to fully replicate whatever is happening between the file system and the S3 bucket. Right, because you, your import and export policies are identical there. So that's that's, that's right. just going to be maintain a complete two-way synchronization between the S3 bucket and that path in the file system. Yeah, yeah. So what we were hearing was storage admins saying, I want to build an S3 data lake um, and I want to take advantage of all of the latest and greatest S3 features, mm. all of the intelligent tiering and all of that. But my users, they need a POSIX file system. That's that's how their applications run. That's what they're comfortable with. Uh, you know, object doesn't make any sense to them. And so this gives them that kind of best of both worlds. It's it's a fast file interface for all of their S3 data. I I, I swear this is voodoo. Because um, <laughs> this this is this is a this is an RFP and a deployment. Uh, and, a, and an acceptance plan that would usually take, I don't know, 12 months. It's, it's all in a box with a button on the front. That's... <laughs> yeah. You know, sometimes it's the simplest things that, that customers will, will um, be most impressed with. Um, you know, a, a very simple monitoring tab uh, that we can, you know, we can have where you can click on this tab and you can just start to see, you know, throughput, capacity, IOPS. We're, we're always building out more and more capabilities, more metrics and tracking. But a lot of this stuff is, you know, readily available in the file system. And so you can just have some CloudWatch logs set up or with some CloudWatch monitors set up. Mm -hmm. You can get an alarm uh, on a Sunday afternoon that you're running out of storage and you probably need some more. You could you could actually address that before yeah. it became a problem. And in fact, on your Sunday afternoon, when you get that alarm, you could actually just log into the console and extend the file system. Right. Yeah, and, and and some customers have chosen to to automate that as well. They they have a lambda <laughs> function. They, do, they, they, have, they, they detect and they have a lambda function and they decide you know how much extra capacity they might want to add um, based on you know their own business needs. So you could sit at home and actually just reply to the email saying approved. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, can approved. you show can you show us how the file system expands? Like how do you actually expand an existing file system and stretch it out? Yeah, so you know it, it's you know it's just this update button right here. You have the current current capacity. This one was a was a one point two terabyte uh, file system, um, and and you know we could we could scale this up to a you know a twelve terabyte file system if we wanted to. Um, one click of the button, and then now we're we're basically making all the underlying changes on the file system. Uh, it's it's non non disruptive because we're just adding more servers uh, in this case. Yep. Uh, and and you know eventually this this updating um, will will come through. Uh, it's also tracked in in kind of the updates tab. Uh, but that's that's basically it. That was the process, uh, and it, it'll take a few minutes, and we'll we'll provision those new servers. There's there's a whole pile of people around the world that are watching this, just crying into their hands at the moment when they realize that they don't have one of these. We sort of spoke about the other week, but we we haven't mentioned here, and and it's definitely worth mentioning. You alluded to it earlier, the compression. Mm -hmm. When you're creating the file system, actually selecting compression is actually a really smart move because um, you, you know, all of these servers, the actual file servers have got these very, very, you know, high performance processors in them, the Graviton 2s. That's right. You can do the data compression so fast on the fly that you're able to actually match the front end bandwidth of those servers, the network bandwidth, by just essentially compressing all of the data. Uh, which essentially just doubles your throughput to the back end. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that, that's right. So you know, this this is that eighty four terabyte file system. We just finished creating it, um, and and when I when I had created it before, uh, I, I didn't turn on data compression. So you know, I can go ahead once again a few clicks. Uh, we we offer LZ four as as our data compression. So you algorithm. can do it on the fly while the file system exists. 
Yeah, we can change? update. We can update it. So we activate the data compression, meaning any newly written files will automatically be uh, be compressed. We don't touch any existing files in this okay. case, um, but but you can, if you wanted to, kind of re you know rewrite uh, any any existing files. Um, but yeah, by default, we 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 basically turn it on here. Um, once again, th this will take a few seconds because it's very quick. But uh, now we're basically telling all of these servers that underpin the Lustre file system to start compressing data as it's written. And uh, you know what that means, as you noted, is we're we're writing less to disk, um, which means we can get better throughput to our to our you know effective throughput to these disks. Hmm. And then uh, you know if if we were to get a two to one compression ratio uh, with this file system in particular, which is around you know ten gigabytes per second of throughput, uh, right. a two to one compression ratio that eventually leads to it to it becoming a twenty gigabyte per second uh, file system. And you know some customers don't get fifty percent for sure. Some are you know some already have compressed data that they're writing, and so it's it's zero. Uh, you know, right. many are in the twenty percent range, and, and some go as high as eighty percent. But uh, but the truth is that when you're when you're dealing with really large volumes of scientific data, it's actually more useful most of the time to deal with it in an uncompressed form, mm -hmm. because you're particularly some of these workloads are doing like really enormous high speed random reads and seeks all over all over a namespace, um, uh, reading and writing data. I mean that. You, you really do need it living in an uncompressed format to do that easily. Right, right. So so it's not a, it's not uncommon at all, in certainly in my um, space, to find an awful lot of data that's uncompressed and to be able to benefit from this. That's pretty cool. Yeah, and you know, and it's it's effectively free to our users because it doesn't consume those client side resources either. Right? Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, it's not going to impact the performance of your workload. That's right. That's right. right. Um, that's actually that is super neat. Um, mm -hmm. so is there anything else we want to talk about? Yeah. Uh, at reInvent, one of my customers shared with me, uh, what they thought was their, their most unexpected, uh, value gain from, from working with AWS, uh, for these HPC workloads. And what they said was it changed the way that, that, that the behavior of their researchers, they no longer felt like they were competing with their peers for a fixed pool of compute and storage. Yeah. Uh, they didn't feel like the bar was so high to test new ideas and explore. And so they could actually, you know, propose more things, try smaller experiments and not feel as though they had to self-select, you know, only particular ideas. And so their rate of innovation just went, just went way up. Just the ability to iterate your science when it's convenient to you. I mean, scientists are the most rare species on earth, I think. Um, <laughs> It takes decades to create a new one. Uh, you've just shown that it only takes a few minutes to create a cluster. This is great. <laughs> All right. Um, Jordan, thank you for coming today. This has actually been a really good discussion. Um, you're going to come back and show us some more stuff. I'm pretty certain you're going to have some more voodoo to show us in a few months' time too. Yeah, we've got more tricks up our sleeve. <laughs> Brilliant. All, All right. right. Uh, to everybody else out there, um, if you have any other ideas, topics that you want to see us cover in a future tech short, uh, our DMs are open. Find us on Twitter and chase us for, you know, with your idea. We'll see what we can do to fit it into the schedule. Uh, for now, uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Jordan. Thank you. Take care.